All right, welcome folks. I'm going to uh, be promoting everyone to panelist. So you're gonna have the ability to unmute, um, but I would just ask that you stay muted until we get going and then um, you'll be able to ask questions and we'll do a little bit of housekeeping before we start, um, but please stay muted for the meantime. Are we going to wait for a couple of minutes? Yeah, I'm, I've got a little intro bit that I'll do um, just to get everyone situated, and then we'll uh, then we'll kick it off. Sorry, I think I missed that part of your. <laughs> Sorry, you had to repeat yourself. No worries. <laughs> So folks, um, you are all now panelists, and that means that you're able to unmute yourself and talk. But yeah, as I said, please stay muted. Um, if you start making noise, um, I'll just mute you, which uh, just don't take it personally. But um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, So yeah, welcome and good afternoon, everybody. I think most of you probably know me. I'm Jonathan Weber. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Complete Streets Program Manager at Locomotion. Uh, I think most of you probably know Locomotion, but our mission is to make walking and biking a way of life across Vermont. And uh, supporting the adoption of e-bikes is for sure a, uh, a big part of that work right now. So that's exactly what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, the adoption of e-bikes sort of by, by entities other than uh, just folks out there riding around for transportation and recreation, but also how organizations like public works departments and businesses, um, parks and rec, can, can start using e-bikes uh, as part of their fleets. So first, a little bit of housekeeping before we get to the presentation. Um, we should all have panelist ability at this point, some folks trick, trickling in um, still, and I'll promote you to panelists, and I'll give you the ability to talk. But basically, um, as I said, please stay muted once I do promote you. Um, once we get going with the presentation, uh, we do encourage you to chime in at any point if you have a question or comment. Um, and we'll have some discussion time at the end if you prefer to wait as well. Um, but again, please keep yourself muted unless you are asking a question or, or giving a comment. Um, and if I mute you, don't take it personally. It's just because we were getting some background noise. Um, you're also welcome to type questions into the chat or the questions section, uh, and I'll field them to the presenters if you prefer to do it that way. Um, if you have any technical issues, feel free, again, post them in the chat or the questions, um, or if that's not working, you can email me at jonathan at localmotion.org. Uh, this is being recorded today, and we'll share it out with you uh, in the follow-up email that you'll get tomorrow. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. We have two presenters today. Uh, Patricia Capinos is the Infrastructure Sales Manager at Saris, which is a Wisconsin-based company uh, that seeks to improve the experience of all types of cyclists with its selection of bike storage, transportation, and other products. And Renee Calloway, who's the Pedestrian Bicycle Administrator for the City of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and I think Madison is just as cold and I think almost as snowy as Vermont, but I think pretty nice there today. So, All right, Patricia and Renee, I'll uh, turn it over to you to take it away. Hi guys, thank you for joining us this afternoon and letting us come in and talk a little bit about our eCargo bike program. I uh, would also like to um, throw out there, if you guys have questions in the chat, feel free to throw them in the chat, uh, raise your hand and we'll happy to uh, kind of work with the flow a little bit here. Um, like Jonathan said, my name is Patricia and I work for Sarah Cycling Group. Uh, we are a uh, manufacturer of various cycling products such as automotive racks, uh, indoor trainers and now e-cargo bikes. So, and I'm very happy to have Renee back on with us for another wonderful panel. So let's get started. Uh, see, cute little picture of some kids delivering some food on cargo bikes. It's our non-disclosure agreement, but I just left it in because it's cute kids on the cargo bike. This bike is actually right now out in Portland, Oregon, being used to pick up trash and do other things out on the bike path. So. Uh, these kids are very disappointed that they don't get to use it right now. Uh, they're so cute, though. 
so when we talk about cargo bikes, especially in the municipal sector, um, and we're going to focus this a little more on the municipal sector than the enterprise sector, we talk about the different reasons why cargo bikes are good for our community. One of which is that the sustainability and climate goals that we can help reach, uh, they're obviously not an ICE vehicle. Uh, so electricity, very good for sustainability. This also opens up a lot of grant opportunities for you, different funding options that you might want to find and look in your sustainability departments. They're cost competitive in that when you compare to say a golf cart or a gator, you're about the exact same cost um, for a golf cart, about half the cost of a gator and obviously uh, with about a quarter of a cost of the of a truck um, that you've got there. So operational efficiencies, being able to use bike infrastructure, bike lanes, um, being able to park uh, on the side, you know, sidewalks versus having to find a parking space. Employee wellness benefits. Uh, you'll find that a lot of employees, when given the option to ride bikes, really get a kick out of it. They have a good time with it. Um, E-bikes especially are known for health benefits. You can reach 93% of your heart rate that you do on a bike with an e-bike. Um, and I know for me personally, sometimes just getting on the bike in the morning or just forcing myself to go out and commute can really be a huge um, benefit and boost to my mental health. So um, I see that in a lot of other employees as well. Um, equity opportunities, one of the great things with bikes is being able to offer um, employees and other people in the community uh, a transportation option that's not super slow, that's a little bit faster, that can carry a little bit more weight. Um, that for people that might not have a driver's license. And maybe that's because they're um, an immigrant, maybe it's because they just never got it or it was too expensive. You know, in Wisconsin, we have to pay for our driver's licenses and the courses to get them. Um, that's a barrier for a lot of people. So these bikes are really can break down a lot of the equity barriers that we have. Community outreach, if you've ever ridden a cargo bike, especially a giant cargo bike, you're gonna get a lot of attention on the bike path. You're gonna get People will rubber deck <laughs> as you're riding by. They'll stop. They'll ask you. I got stopped, I think, four times on Friday, just riding around. <laughs> People are like, what is this thing? So, it, you know, as a branded vehicle, it's really something that you can reach a lot of people in the community. And then obviously it helps highlight and promote bike, bicycle friendly communities. If you've got the government using your bike or bikes in the bike community, then helps get that bike infrastructure going a little bit faster. So one thing that we like to talk about is an active versus sedentary type of transportation. Um, active transportation would be like your bicycles and sedentary are vehicles that you're not moving very much in. So golf carts, gators, trucks. Um, as we talk again, a lot of the health benefits, a lot of different things that you know, government especially are looking for. Um, we're seeing a lot of, of movement towards the active mode of transportation. One thing um, we also like to talk about is user experience. Uh, so this was actually a week ago, yes, today, um, out on the bike path. This is the Badger State Trail. I was heading into work and I saw this, uh, it's actually a Wisconsin DNR vehicle uh, riding up the, the trail. So of course I stopped quick and you know went and took some pictures the poor guy was eating lunch. But <laughs> um, a lot of what our, our uh, workers talk about is that the user experience of putting a truck on a bike path feels uncomfortable, that it feels like you're invading the space and that the truck isn't really there. Um, actually, with this guy in particular, he talked about how, um, you know, he's taking up more than half of the bike lane and that, you know, if he were to go over a little bit more, he would be on the grass and tearing up the grass. Um, and this bike lane ends real you know, shortly after this, it turns into limestone and he can't go on the limestone right now with the truck and the bulk of the bike path is actually limestone. So if we were to take the same situation and replace it with a bike, definitely feels a lot friendlier, a little, a lot less bulk on the bike path. You feel a little bit more like you fit in there. Um, I think this is a really important point from both a user as I'm a cyclist riding and seeing this, but also as an employee um, and feeling more comfortable on the bike path. It was funny, I will say the guy had never heard of a cargo bike before. I showed him a picture and he's like, yeah, we could totally do this. I could trailer it over here because it's 80 miles essentially. He's like, well, I'd trailer it to Monroe and then I'd ride it here to here. And then I, I was just like, this is all it takes. It's just giving you guys the idea. And I don't have a picture of it in here, but I'll tell you what was in the back of the truck was a tree trimmer, a shorter tree trimmer, two chainsaws, a rake and a pole driver and a cone everything that could be in the back of a bike it was there was hardly anything in there and he said they do that every week they're driving 80 miles uh or 160 so now getting over into what renee is gonna talk about here renee 
how do we talk about getting pilot started? Sure. I mean, I think you have to have a champion, right? Um, and I think this particular pilot was easy because as soon as I heard about this, and obviously, you know, the city of Madison, we're lucky Sarah's is right here, heard about it, thought, yes, that's exactly the kind of thing um, of interest. So built-in champion, I reached out to our sustainability coordinator, also a natural champion, and I said, yeah, let's do this pilot. You know, we had some advantage. Um, we had already mentioned this idea of cargo bikes for higher usage, both by the city and, and others in our bicycle plan. So we had already done some work in that area. So this was a great opportunity to bring some of that work to fruition. Um, and really after that, I just sat down with our sustainability coordinator and said, okay, who are our contacts in the city that might be good fits for piloting this? Um, and let's get them together and talk about it. Absolutely. And one of the things you did was you had it in the city of Madison bike plan. Talk to us a little bit about that and how it helped. Yeah, sure. It's kind of funny. Like we did this bike plan back in 2015 and this is actually, it was a cooperative effort. It's for our whole metropolitan and county area. Um, but I said that I wanted to work on this section because I was really intrigued by how cargo bikes could sort of meet our needs in the future of um, just more sustainable ways of doing our work. And so there was interest in it. The plan got approved with it in. And for me, that was sort of like the government saying, like the city saying, yes, we support this. So I felt like when I heard about the spike and the opportunity to pilot it, that way back in 2015, I'd been given the okay to do it. <laughs> I've heard from other communities that this is a huge thing that you did and that when it's the spark yeah. of like, how do I get this done? And this is one of the things that they're like, oh, yes, do it this way. And yeah. um, I think that thank you. And that's awesome that you kind of spearheaded this, you know, four years before. <laughs> right. Like I had no idea this opportunity would come along. I just thought like this needs to happen. And luckily um, others, apparently, you know, who actually build the products saw this as an opportunity as well. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So a year ago, and this is pre-COVID, uh, we mm -hmm. had the, the first roundtable uh, out at the city of Madison, and this is downtown Madison, right in front of the city county building. Renee, who did you get to come to this meeting and why? <laughs> Sure. So I think the idea was it, it would be better to like get people to see what we were talking about instead of just seeing saying, hey, we want the employees in your department to use a bike for their job because, well, I mean, we already have bikes like they're just regular bikes um, that people can check out and use. And I'm sure they're like, well, we already do that. And our other like we can't put a chainsaw uh, in the basket of a bike. What are you talking about? So I felt like people really needed to see it. And so I just tried to brainstorm some departments where I felt like they had the kind of jobs that would be interesting to trial and see how it works and would include, you know, some departments that have people that I thought would naturally like it and want to do it and be sort of enthusiastic cheerleaders. And then some departments where I thought, you know, they have a lot of employees who are going to be super skeptical, but I feel like they have jobs that could work. And if I can get the managers to like see it and imagine it, that we could try it. And uh, luckily we did this like right before we all started working from home um, because that hands-on experience, it made a huge difference in how people perceived the pilot, if they were able to be at this round table or not. All right, I live next to a highway, so I try to like stay muted. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, personally having been at the, the round table, I did notice a huge difference in the people that were there versus the ones that weren't there when we were handing off the bike. And, you know, by the time we're handing off the bike in August, like there's masks, there's the buildings are closed. There's like, it was literally like outside handing it off and, and hoping that I taught them how to ride the bike right. So um, I think this really did help. And I learned a lot through this um, actually about how to introduce people to bikes and how to introduce especially city workers and people who might not be as um, thrilled about the idea. Um, I, I point out one of the guys in this photo and he did not want to ride the bike. He had no, he did not care. He did not want to ride the bike. He wasn't into it. But one of the reasons why was because all of the people in the, his offices were in this building. 
and he felt like everyone was watching him and he didn't want to fail. And it, it's been a common theme, especially with some of the guys in like the streets and the in the kind of older generation a little bit doesn't necessarily want to fail in front of the guys. So sometimes, hey, that's good to know, manipulate how you introduce them to the bikes a little bit differently so that you're not in front of the you know the office building or it's a smaller group or whatever. But um, I think that's an important key as as advocates are trying to introduce bikes to kind of keep in mind how these people are experiencing it and can you change anything to change the experience? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna interrupt with a question of my own and maybe maybe yeah. you're gonna get to this and if, if you are, that's fine, just ignore it. But um, how, how has adoption gone among employees who weren't at this round table? Yeah, and I think Patricia, you do have some slides about that that we can talk about later, but I do think like our original plan was to have like more of these sort of like types of things to introduce people to the bike and just to train them on how it works because it you know there is a little bit of a learning curve and because of COVID it really turned into a this department has it and one person kind of hands it off and does like this like physically distant like explanation which definitely left something to be desired. <laughs> yeah 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 I'll say what I noticed was you know so I handed it off to fleet and we just had a very I mean it was like five minutes maybe mm -hmm. 10 minutes of just doing the bike but then a couple people later I had to go fix something on the bike and it was with these parks guys and they were older and you know they had said oh this the girl this girl Maddie that had handed it off and oh she did it and whatever they just they didn't get it they didn't understand mm -hmm. it they didn't want to get it they didn't care but by the time I get there and they're all just like kind of curious about the bike and I eventually got them on the bike and like they no, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. but I think that, that that missing piece of just having a day, someone going in and giving getting people excited and training is is really vital. Um, and what our original plan was to actually have me be a league certified instructor and go around and give training to um, individuals so that, you know, as part as a city worker too, you know, the risk management part of it, just having that little bit of how to ride a bike in the streets instead <laughs> of training. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is a very different bike to ride. So even for people who do bike, like I jumped on it and I was like, oh yeah, I got to execute my turns a little bit differently than I'm accustomed to. <laughs> Turning and shifting. So the first question I ask anybody when we, we demo these bikes is, have you ever been on an e-bike before? And I'm going to tell you, 95% of people, the answer is no. Um, Madison, it's a little bit higher because we have electric uh, bike share but even it's a little bit different than the electric bike share. And even then, so I just dropped one of our bikes off at Bicycle. <laughs> Their bikes are, are regulated with the, the electric, so they don't ever shift through all of the modes. And they're, whoa, what is this? So it's even when you assume and think, well, e-bike share is gonna know exactly how to use an e-bike, then actually not really. <laughs> so um, kind of just picking those, those things up and shifting. I've noticed that with our bikes, a lot of the cyclists, like the hardcore cyclists um, struggle with it the most because they <laughs> try to force it to shift and be like a normal bike. It's an internally geared hub for us. It's a roll off hub. So you have to pause your pedal stroke shift, but you can go all the way um, up or down. But yeah, it's it's fun to watch. I like watching people bike. <laughs> so I just for the folks on the call. Um, you know, if, if any of you are thinking about adopting this for your organization, Local Motion is totally happy to help you put together trainings, provide trainers. Um, we'd, lo we'd love to help out with that. So we're here as a resource if you're thinking about this. Yeah, and I think personally, I think that's how it, it you want it to be, is to make it like even as a manufacturer on a national level, like you come in, you get the, ins the inspiration and like we give you some training, but we would like to partner with the local groups and say this is the relationships you know you guys want to develop between your bike advocates your city and all that fun stuff so fully support that <laughs> so renee we had about 18 participants uh i think fill out the surveys anyways <laughs> yeah yeah so you know we started this later um because COVID hit and it just was somewhat unclear with the pandemic how should we be rolling this out how should we be rolling this out so we did start later um, and we also, some departments, you know, like we thought, oh, this will be really awesome for public meetings, right? Like hand all your boards and materials, but we weren't having those except on Zoom. So 
um, that part didn't happen. And obviously getting people to fill out surveys isn't always the easiest either. Um, but we did, I think, you know, we had um, a mix of ages. Um, you know, we had 18 people fill out the survey, although I know there were people who rode the bike. Um, and um, sort of our focus ended up being on sort of our, like our fleet, we got them to use it because obviously we would want them to sort of see it, um, understand how it works as well because they would have a role in purchasing and maintenance. So wanted to get it in their hands. Um, and then our engineering department, uh, streets, parks, and then my department in traffic engineering used it a little bit as well. Um, and so, you know, we did a lot of different things, you know, a lot of maintenance and trash collection, planting, uh, we moved a bike rack. We took some kids' bikes out for them to use. Seed collecting, um, just you know, kind of a, a range of the kinds of things that were going on in the city um, last summer. Yeah, absolutely. You guys had a lot of jobs. We did end up having a lot of jobs. Um, you know, I think what was interesting was you know people weren't really going very far, and you think like before they were doing this pilot, they were taking some sort of you know, we definitely have electric vehicles in our fleet, don't get me wrong, like we're definitely moving um, to more electrification, um, but obviously a lot of people are using gas powered trucks <laughs> to, yeah. and you know, like they're going four miles on some of these trips. Um, like our shortest trip was 1.2 miles and it's just like, this is such a great tool as we all know for trips of these short distances. Um, someone did go 12 miles, which is pretty, um, it had it had a plenty of battery life, and with the pedal assist, um, you know, people it, like it worked well for them. Um, and then, you know, because we were partnering with our sustainability coordinator, we really wanted to look at those sustainability metrics because that also makes a really good selling point for why we um, would want to do this in the long term. Um, and just really understanding how that fits into our overall city. Um, sustainability and climate protection planning. Yeah, I thought that the short distance trips, you've made a lot of good points. And we've we've seen that in other cities now where it's being used, you know, not, especially this bike in particular can take 661 pounds. So it's yeah. being used, I know, right? It's not the one you necessarily want to take 40 miles every single day. Um, but if you want to put a tree in it and go around the corner and play yeah. the tree and go back and forth with gravel, like it's, perfect you know um so it, it is a little bit about picking the right you know arrow out of the quiver sometimes um especially with these cargo bikes but it's an exciting area yeah and i see someone asked a question if we also looked at how much fuel we saved and we we probably could go back and kind of figure that out we didn't our sustainability coordinator did kind of those metrics and she was interested in other kinds of things but i'm sure she could have easily also figured that out because i think the city has like knows for different departments kind of what they know what vehicles we have in their gas mileage so it would be doable yeah i want to say i think some of that was just because of the prevalence of electric vehicles in the city's fleet we do we, i mean we definitely have an increasing number of those so um but you know obviously a lot of our park staff and um streets are still they haven't fully you know have those vehicles because winter like they're not always seen as being ideal in the winter so it's kind of a slow movement as vehicles improve and people's perceptions improve yeah absolutely so one of the jobs that the city of madison did uh and i was actually here this day <laughs> is planting trees downtown madison um so this street if you've been downtown madison it's it's next to state street and university avenue um very high traffic um touristy type place bars restaurants um, so they're in here planting trees in all the downtown area. Um, so here I thought this is kind of a good overview of what the streetscape looks like. One thing for us to think about is, you know, all of these big city vehicles are taking up paid parking spots. Um, so sometimes that's a, a concern. <laughs> uh, they also, every single one of those vehicles that's not our bike goes beep, 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 anytime it backs up. This was at eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. These are all residential, you know, it was loud, I'm not going to lie. Um, so this is a, a great photo where they took a 400 pound tree and they 
put it into the cargo bike with a forklift. And I did not expect that one. <laughs> yeah. No, I think this is kind of interesting because I hadn't necessarily thought that forestry would want to participate in this program. Um, but they reached out and asked if they could because they were going to be planting these trees in our sort of downtown area, which is a pretty constrained space and where they get a lot of complaints about the beeping noise when they work. I mean, a lot of students in the area too, so eight o'clock is considered pretty early for starting work. Um, so they reached out and said, we want to try this um, and use it as one of our tools in doing this job and see how it performs. So I was like, sure, if you want to try it for it. <laughs> you know, the funny thing, roll it up on these guys, because they just were like, go take pictures. And I was like, all right. I thought for sure they were going to hate the bike. Like you, like they're all like, you know, construction worker dudes. They got their knives on their belts, and they got the Carhartt, and they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're construction dudes. They love the bike. They loved this bike, and I, it just, I, you're like, man, you know, you can't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> that was my lesson of the day. But it turned out, I think two of them had a cargo bike. One of them has a cargo bike. One of the the managers has a cargo bike. Yeah, they're surprisingly bike friendly. Crew. Yes, yes. Yeah. They, the, the one guy's like, I got a Yuba. The other guy had just bought like an e-bike from Slow Roll. These two are, I think I know the one guy, but it was like, you just didn't expect the level yeah. of cargo bike knowledge. Um, I mean, I, so I think that's the thing, like when the bike is around, like in the city, other people see it other departments and there's going to be people who are creative thinkers in every department who think oh I just saw someone doing this with the bike I bet I could do this other thing with the bike yeah it's been it's been interesting what I love about this picture too is the juxtaposition of the bobcat with the bike and they're kind of doing normally they would put the tree in that bobcat and you know just transitioning those jobs and they're they're kind of it's a small job it's not like we're re you know, reinventing the wheel here, but just being able to add that little bit there, a little bit of emission savings, a little bit of more exercise, a little fun community engagement. Trust me, when they were riding down the street with a tree in the bed of that thing, people were stopping and asking questions. <laughs> it was pretty fun. And uh, this picture I love because that is the other guy got in the bike and they rode off with the bike and the guy in the tree. <laughs> I think I think we probably needed to like balance the load maybe a little bit better, but there are shocks in the front, so um, that worked off. That day, crazy. One of the things too we hear about, which I love this picture for, is um, that don't take away my truck. And you know, it's the where I like to eat lunch. It's where we like to congregate a little bit. And it was pretty interesting to watch the bike just be part of the equipment. It wasn't anything special. It was just you know the truck for the day. Um, another thing they were doing is just, you know, same thing with the the bobcat, pulling sod in, moving it around, that all that fun stuff. Here's where they actually planted the tree. Um, and what was cool about this this scene is that you can see the bike just parked on the bike infrastructure on the you know sidewalk and not having to block off the road. It's something that a lot of different uses can do. For instance, like bike share that needs to you know, come in and do battery swaps instead of parking the big sprinter van, they can take a smaller cargo bike, um, all those different types of utilities uh, with the bikes. So uh, a couple things that other jobs that were done, I think, um, Renee, you didn't do the bike rack, did you? That was... Uh, no, that was someone on my staff who moved the bike rack, um, but he he saw that it worked. I mean, it was no big deal to move it in the bike rack um so and then you can see like our fleet office um like as soon as they got it they started charging it on one of our solar panels um which was really awesome so which apparently you have some type of awesome solar panel too i've showed this to other cities and they're like oh they've got the gen x 3000 or something <laughs> i was like yeah all I know is that we have solar panels and they charge the bike on it uh, when they could, which was really, I think, I mean, it's just really awesome how these things can like work together. Yeah, yeah. I, there's something special about that solar charger. Uh, I want to say they said it was the only one in the country or something. But oh. anyway, 
yeah I, I, I mean i keep meaning to look it up <laughs> i mean i think it's really great because obviously i i don't know what vermont is like but obviously here in the midwest like our energy sources are not always the cleanest so something that we're really working on as a city as well is like expanding these sort of renewable energy sources and pairing the two together is you know just really perfect definitely Absolutely. something we're working on here as well i want to um i want to field a couple questions so yeah. Uh, one is from uh, my colleague Dave Cohen, who runs a whole um, e-bike promotion outfit down in Brattleboro that we work with quite a bit. And he asked, any thoughts about e-cargo bikes that are adaptable and modular like the Rad Power Bikes Radboro? That can be a pedicab dump truck or dump bike, sorry, cargo carrier and flatbread. Um, this allows for multiple uses at events, cycling without age programs, and everyday mobility. So I know we're talking a lot about the Saris bike. Um, mm -hmm. any, any thoughts on sort of some of the other options out there? Yeah, I mean, I could speak, I think there's a lot of awesome options for cargo bikes. And like I said before, I think it's a, a quiver and an arrow situation that you're going to have uh, certain bikes are going to do great jobs in certain tasks and others are going to be better for other tasks. I think um, when we look at things like the rad power bikes, like those are super cost competitive. They, you know, perform okay. They're kind of, you know, they're cost competitive, but I think that they serve a purpose. I also think that you look at long tails, like the big surly big dummy, I think is another awesome cargo bike option. I've seen some really cool things. I once saw somebody serving drinks off the back of that thing, like going down the bike path, like she was serving drinks. And, you know, you can come up with all this great things that I really think it's like, look at the tasks that you need to have done and then try to match the task with the bike. Like I said, our Tender 1000, I would not choose that bike if I wanted to do like one batch or one grocery thing of Instacart, you know, where I've just taken one person's groceries and I got to go 20 miles. Don't, that's not your bike. <laughs> you know, that might be a more of a rad, um, is it the rad burrow? I think it's got kind of the longer tail in the front end of it. Or maybe uh, it's rad the rad wagon is, is the long tail version. Yeah, <laughs> like the, I think those bikes are way better for that, but you don't want to put a tree in those bikes. So. <laughs> I think um, yeah. I think you know there was another bike that we could have demoed from Sarah's which would have been a really great bike for different kinds of things but we weren't doing those things last summer like so we ended up not borrowing that bike because the types of activities that were happening in the city were more appropriate for this and I know you know like we did a, a seminar we did a webinar during our bike week with just some local businesses that use bikes yeah that bike there we didn't end up borrowing it because the kinds of things we were imagining were more the public meetings or just some you know field inspections or whatever and they were just happening in such a different manner that it didn't work for us to do that during this last year um during the pilot that but we had imagined would have happened in march there when we were all foolish and had no idea what was coming uh, <laughs> right. so and we did a webinar with some other business types and you know there's obviously a lot of different kinds of bikes that are out there that fit kind of different situations and our staff we have a our bike share system b cycle is all electric um and you can check out a pass um to take that bike and do whatever job you need to do and for a lot of people who are doing our field inspections, like they, they take that because they just have a clipboard and a hard hat, you know, and so they just take one of those electric bikes because it has a basket and that does the trick for them. So I think, you know, you kind of have to think about what your jobs are. Nice. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of folks on this call are, you know, they're in public works departments, they're in various city governments, they're not experts on e-bikes. So, but if, if you want some help, some sort of input on what kind of bike might work for uh, the tasks that you're looking to do, you know, you can reach out to me. Um, Dave Cohen with V-Bike is also a great resource for this kind of information. Um, and we can, we can really help you out and make a good recommendation. And I would say, I think that Bosch is doing some demo stuff, I think, as well with multiple brands, um, which would be something to potentially think about. Um, I'm all for like, hey, check them all out look at every brand for every type and see, because they're also different. Like you, you've got hub motors versus mid drive motors. Um, if you're newer to e-bikes, I guess I can explain that real quick. So on our bikes work, what's called a mid drive motor. So the motor is right here in between the pedals. And the way that it works is as you pedal, 
the motor then assists your pedal stroke and gives you a little bit more power to it. Uh, with ours, it goes up to like 425% extra power versus what you put down on the pedal. Um, another, the other type of e-bikes is called a hub motor, where you'll see the motors back here, either in the, the rear or the front hub, if it's a two wheeled trike. Um, and those types of motors are constantly giving you power to the bike. So it feels a little bit different. Those are the ones that may or may not have a throttle on them. Um, so as you're going and pedaling, like your pedal stroke isn't really affecting the amount of power you're getting out of it. So the difference mainly, to be honest with those, it starts to be cost. Um, hub motors are a little bit cheaper than a mid-drive motor. Um, and the mid-drive can be from any, there's a number of different manufacturers, Shimano, Bros, Bosch is what we use. Uh, the Fang, I think now does a mid-drive and you can buy them on Amazon <laughs> if you wanna make a conversion. So lots of different um, options out there. So some of our uh, takeaways from the city of Madison, which we've kind of discussed a little bit, Renee. Training. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, obviously that round table, like the people who saw the bike and talked it over and like, you know, really like were able to explore the compartment, like they, they just could see that this was gonna work better than the people who weren't able to attend those because we only did the one, um, which was generally with more management level people to get them on board. So, you know, they just didn't understand it and they really didn't understand the why they were being asked to do this as well. Like we were obviously, when we had a round table, being able to say like, this is with all these different goals versus just like, here's a bike, take it out and do your job. Um, and, you know, obviously two people who are not like they're not that aware of how this worked like worried that they would run out of the battery and it would be really hard to come back to their you know start an end point um and it is a bigger so even for people who ride bikes you know this is a wider thing and so it feels very different you know just in the street using it versus a regular bike it, it's going to take off a lot of the bike lane um so you know like they just had concerns before they took it out and and obviously it handles very differently. You know, it's not a, a nimble turning and like you have to like adapt to how it rides um, and have a little experience. But surprisingly people um, gave it a pretty good score, even people who were super negative. And I specifically wanted people who would be super negative to take it out because I felt like we would probably learn more from them than people who were like, yay, a bike, I'm so excited. Like they're just gonna be like, yeah, I love it. Like, let's get me one. Um, so I wanted those negative people because you have to like really get it integrated into a department to make this a long-term viable program. Um, and most people, did, like, I think they thought going into it, like, this is going to be exhausting. Like, this bike is huge and I'm going to put all this heavy stuff in it and I don't care if it's electric. I'm going to be so exhausted. And they really prim primarily were only mildly fatigued. And a lot of these people, you know, didn't rate them as having, like, great fitness in the beginning either. So... It just shows that it worked. Um, and the great part was how they were, like how they people reacted to them. Like first off, we got really positive comments after some newspaper articles of the mayor's office did, which, you know, a lot of times I don't see them. Uh, like I see really negative comments. <laughs> so it was nice to have some things where people were like, yes, this is great. This aligns with what we think the city should be doing on climate change and just really liked it and people, like a, there's a lot of work that takes place on the paths, like seed collection and prairie that we have established there and just signs that need changed or things like that, right? And um, a lot of times employees hate having to drive on the paths because people don't like it. Like the parks department employees really are reluctant, our streets department who has like seed collection and prairies they maintain. And they had like such amazing experiences taking this bike because people were nice to them and asking questions and all the kids thought they were going to get ice cream and were a little disappointed it wasn't actually an ice cream truck but you know like really positive comments and like people really were um, excited to see it so that was obviously really nice for a lot of employees. Um, and you know earlier we talked just about the equity angle and in talking to some of our staff, like we partner with a lot of different programs, like a lot of cities do to kind of get people who have trouble getting employment, particularly youth. Um, we have some programs where we work with youth and they don't have driver's licenses a lot of times um, or 
And this is an opportunity to hire them and have a way for them to do work um, in these programs and not be like, well, come back when you can get a driver's license. Um, so it really like supports our uh, equity work as well. And I mean, this is Wisconsin. I don't know if you've heard, but we do have a little bit of an impaired driving problem here. And if an employee loses their license, like here's a way to keep them in a job um, because they don't have to have a driver's license. Yeah, I think that's, I've heard that way too many times in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we got a question about how long the pilot lasts. I want to say it was end of July through about end of November, because I think those last two weeks, it was like 70 degrees in November, and y'all were like, can we keep the bike? <laughs> I know, right? Like, I was refusing to return it at that point. I was like, I think we could still keep, we're still happy here. <laughs> and yeah, I don't think, like, it was probably July when we started, because we were just, you know, we were going to start it right away in April, and then it just was kind of unclear. So it's unfortunate that we lost some time um, just with not being sure how to roll it out during a pandemic and what we were all gonna be doing and how would people be working. And so um, it was a little bit shorter than we hoped. But I feel like we got some good feedback anyway. Yeah, I mean, I just volunteered with it while we were waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? It was being used for food pantry deliveries um, by Sarah. So it was getting good use um, until we took it. It was pretty fun to, to learn how it works, but um, just some ideas for your parks applications. We were finding that parks tends to be the least, you know, path of least resistance in different cities. Um, so it's something to kind of keep in mind if your objective is just to a get your foot in the door parks might be your best place to get a foot in the door um they all also tend to be more bike friendly they're really they look at you know the user experience in the parks that sort of thing that's what we're hearing um and there's just so many different parks applications for it so trash collection vector control mosquito control all that stuff uh controlled burns, setting up races. I've heard that a bunch. Um, we had uh, a race organization here, an event group here that was you know, setting cones um, just for the, the 5Ks or whatever. Uh, so lots of different ideas. So one thing we do like to touch on, um, and Renee kind of touched on it a little bit when we talked about uh, the fleet department having it um, and being managed by a fleet. Uh, Renee, I don't know if you want to talk to us a little bit about the equipment sure. versus the equipment. Sure. So everyone, you know, does their budgets a little bit differently, but I think it's not uncommon to have these sort of like, you know, like vehicle, like reduction or reductions in vehicles, right? Like, okay, how can our city have a smaller fleet? Um, and equipment is often looked at a little bit. It's like looked at differently sometimes as like a very different budget line item or the number that you might be allocated is very different from vehicle to equipment. I know we just went are going through, you know, right sizing because that's what we call downsizing um, is right sizing. But it's good to really look at the vehicles that every department has and do they really need them? Are they the right tools for the job? Could it be different? And I think, um, you know, a lot of times it's easier to think about the bike as an equipment item because then it doesn't get counted in sort of the vehicle allotment and that makes people a little bit less nervous that um, especially I think in a winter climate, um, we had a, a delightfully snowy winter. Um, and, you know, it's, like Patricia will say, you can take the bike out in the winter, but if you're going out and you're staying out, it's really like people want to have that warmer environment than a bike. So there's this fear that if it's a vehicle, then that means they do lose their truck access. Um, when really it just means like they have more tools they can put less miles on vehicles, they last longer, and maybe they can rethink the total type of vehicles that they have. But I think there is just some fears in that. And I do wonder, I mean, you're in Vermont, so I think that winter thing would be the same, but I wonder if it was like Southern California, that would be different. <laughs> yeah, it is definitely different in Southern California. They're pretty much like all in. <laughs> <laughs> but between that and their the laws that they have for sustainability it's like yeah. yes um yeah absolutely i think we kind of went over this uh mainly with the parks and rec being early adopters if we can skip through that uh one quick question or question we always get is about range 
um, on the e-bikes. Uh, this is a wonderful calculator that Bosch has uh, that can take a look at what bike you have, what drive motor and all that stuff and give you an idea as to the range. Um, with our bikes, you're with dual batteries, you can typically get about 40 miles out of them. Um, I just did a software update actually on the bike that Madison was using and rode it down to the bicycle yesterday. And it definitely, that update changed things, made that motor move a little bit different, which is great with Bosch. All of their stuff is backwards compatible. So when they do these software updates, you know, and come up with this great new, you know, way that their software calculates your pedal stroke, uh, you can put it on your bike and get all the benefits too. So that really helped. It also said, I mean, I hit 119 miles on range on that bike <laughs> yesterday, but we had, we had a 45 mile an hour wind. <laughs> I still don't know how 119 miles. I was like, what? Um, so one thing is you can play around with. Uh, another thing with the Bosch system and just when you buy different types of e-bikes, one thing to think about is whether or not it's UL certified. And that comes in from the electricity parts of it is essentially you want to make sure your batteries and your chargers aren't going to overheat. Um, and that's where UL certification comes in. It's universal laboratories. I want to say Bosch and I think Shimano it's either Shimano or Panasonic um, are right now currently the only two that are UL certified. And we're starting to see, we're starting to hear from governments and from enterprise that they're starting to require this um, because they see the fire risk and um, using some of these, uh, you know, lesser known brands, I guess, and, and some of these motors coming out of China. You know, we have Crazy Lenny's e-bikes here in Madison and it literally set on fire. So then burned down and then they had a fire sale. So, and he's still going strong. So don't worry about crazy Lenny, but it's just something to think about, especially in, in a uh, municipal aspect um, and especially with charging, you know, will you charge at the bike indoors? Will you take the batteries off? Will you have any type of protocols for those? Um, so just something to think about uh, on that. And the bike that you were looking at is an Urban Arrow Tender 1000. That's what the city of Madison used. Roll off hub, uh, Bosch motor, Front brakes on that bike, uh, the front tires are actually automotive trailer tires, and then it has motorcycle brakes. Uh, beautiful red calipers, if you ever get to see the inside of it. <laughs> They're definitely racing red. Uh, the max total weight, including bike and the rider, is 881 pounds. We say 661 for load, load on it. It is 37 inches wide, so something, th something to think about if you've got um, legislation pending about size of cargo bikes. Uh, yeah, and I think that's about it for us. Uh, we'd love to take any questions from you guys or thoughts, ideas. I think I saw that there was a big dummy with a blender on it. I would just like to know when can I come get some margaritas or I'm in. <laughs> Jonathan, can I unmute myself? <laughs> so, yeah, so um, we got a big dummy like 12 years ago. Maybe, yeah. My husband wrote a proposal on why we should get a cargo bike <clears throat> after when I was pregnant with my third kid. And um, yeah, right. So um, so we did, because we did. We only had one car and he's like, listen, I'm not getting any exercise because we have now three kids. Um, and then he went to um, rock the bike and got a blender, really simple, you know, device. So then as the kids were going through school, our, our that youngest kid just turned 12, um, we would do like these fundraisers at the school, like the, the school carnival. I mean, we, you know, we wouldn't charge any, whether they were doing tickets or something and we'd make smoothies and then go to block parties and we would make margaritas. So come on down in May, <laughs> get a margarita. <laughs> How about August? <laughs> August will be better. <laughs> I might I might actually be out there. I'm not sure. That's awesome. I love, I'll tell you, the, the first time I saw a cargo bike do something crazy was we had this mountain bike race out of my, guy, my friend's farm and it's called the Barnyard Classic. And it's like a mile and a quarter course, but it's got more climbing than anywhere else in Southern Wisconsin. <laughs> so I'm like trying to climb up the hill and it was a partner race and he swapped off right and I look back and there's the dude on the big dummy and the chick is behind him passing out hams <laughs> and they passed me <laughs> it wasn't electric <laughs> I was like that's impressive right there
Tremendous. Um, yeah. Thanks so much. Awesome, awesome presentation. Um, so, folks, every everyone um, in the audience should be unmuted or able to unmute. Um, so, if you have a question, try, just uh, just chime in. I have a, I have a few, um, and I imagine that folks in the audience are wondering um, how winter goes with these bikes. Well. I've been sending it through some snowstorms lately. <laughs> uh, well, not lately, but yeah, actually, um, so we have a, a staff up in Minneapolis and we're in Madison. So we have one of our bikes up in Minneapolis with an engineer right now. And we've all been basically riding these bikes all winter. Um, I think the guys up there are commuting by bike. Like it's rotating through everybody up there. Um, I know one guy took it through a gravel trail that was mostly mud for like 20 miles. I was like, okay, bud, that's, did you take pictures? <laughs> um, but for me personally, we had a day that it was like six inches of snow. Um, and I went out right after probably, I'd call it like the first plow pass, you know, had gone through. And so like, it wasn't like deep powder, but it was like, there was still snow that hadn't been salted and stuff. Um, I got through it just fine. Uh, the bike is seriously capable of doing a lot of it. Now, if you hit pure ice, the rear wheel is going to spin. Mm -hmm. But the good part about that is it's a trike, so it's completely stable and you're not, you're honestly just going to like ice skate around on a bike. It's not going to, and then like if you got to get off, then you got a really good bike to hold on to. But I was able to get it stuck if I tried to get it in like the, the end of the driveway that hadn't been kind of shoveled out, the plow had gone through that. I was able to get it stuck in. Wasn't super hard to get it unstuck, but I'd say two inches and you'd probably be okay. But the other thing I'll say with this is thinking about it this winter, like when it snows, I mean, for us, like we're not talking about you're done for a week, you know, you're, you might be out of it for a day, maybe two days, but you're probably going to be pretty, um, you know, able to ride. You might not have the bike infrastructure that we have, but it should be somewhat okay. I do have some video if anybody's really gung ho about seeing what it looks like in the snow, <laughs> I can send some video out as well. Um, yeah, I did. We, we gave the bike back in November, and I am curious, like in the future, you know, how many staff would think to themselves, "Well, it's not that bad out." I mean, we we do have a pretty strong policy on clearing um, clearing for biking um, in the winter, so it's definitely. I mean, we have I mean, people bike commute all year round. Um, so I am curious once we have our own bikes, which we don't have yet, but we're working on it. Like, how many people will see it and think, "Well, I'm only gonna go out." that's like short and the paths are clear where I'm going and they just take it. Um, we didn't get any winter. We gave it back in November and we had a really warm fall. It would have been fun to have it and just see if it was there and employees were seeing it if they would have just been like, eh, I'm just going a mile. Why not? <laughs> and what also... We have a lot of bike commuters and people who were commuting to their jobs on bikes and then getting in motor vehicles so <laughs> right. there's also maybe an aspect to this where um like because these are fairly low cost vehicles they can be really useful for departments that have seasonal staff and their mm -hmm. staff members really swell in the summer especially yeah. like a parks department i'm thinking of and in that case you know this is still really super useful even if it's not being used that much in the winter um yeah, yeah so we, i see there's a question about studded tires and you know i don't know I know Patricia, you rode a bunch this winter. I mean, for a regular bike, you know, we are we do get a lot of freeze thaw, um, or we do get icy conditions sometimes. Um, and we we have a bunch of lakes in our city, so we have a pretty strict policy on salt use as well. And it's not like it works that great on bike infrastructure. So we do try to sand and be really careful on how we do that. And I don't know what that trike, Patricia, you didn't have studs when you were riding it around. <laughs> No, I wish. <laughs> Just in the front, though. Um, no, uh, we didn't have any studs. I've heard from Urban Arrow that other people have studs on them. If you're looking at uh, this bike in particular, when you hear people talk about the Urban Arrow family, it's the same back end of the bike. So if they can put studs on those bikes, you can put it on these. Um, yeah, as I say, the only time I, I even felt the need for studs was like when I got on pure ice. And for us in Madison, we had a really snowy winter, but I thought like that everything was cleared pretty darn quick this year in that 
I mean, I don't have studs on my bikes, but last year, I think we would have wanted studs, you know, so year by year. <laughs> it was much more snow, probably making it a little bit easier. Last winter, I feel like we had a lot more ice storms. So, you know, we're yeah. kind of in that band of it can go either way in the winter. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we can probably sympathize with that. I was going to guess Vermont probably has some places that are pretty similar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Another question from Dave Cohen. Um, what's the overall cargo bike scene like in Madison? And are there yeah. any delivery services using cargo bikes? Are the bike shops or specialty shops carrying cargo bikes? Yeah. Um, we are doing conversions like Bafang Midrive? We have a place called the Cargo Bike Shop. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, and they're expanding to Minneapolis weirdly instead of the other way around um so we have definitely a growing cargo bike scene here um and I think you're starting uh, like they're getting more common like we're getting to the point where we're talking about what kind of part you know should we change some of our bike parking um, rules to it require cargo bike parking in some locations because they are becoming more common um, we do have some businesses that are starting to use them um it's kind of that's definitely a kind of a growing area we did like i said earlier a little webinar and it was um a popsicle business um that employs people with, who have mental health issues um we have a veterinarian who uh, does house calls um and will take the your pet back by bike um some composting business uh, that does you'll see rolling around bike shops obviously we have mobile bike shops that use cargo bikes um, and community sort of cooperative bike shops that have them um, we have a pharmacist who will uh, do his deliveries by uh, various kinds of bike situations i don't know if you have the cargo bikes that's some expansive panniers for sure um, our library does a bookmobile by bike. Um, so I think it's definitely growing. I think the more you see them out there, I know there's Cargo Bike Shop has a business that they started loaning them a bike to do deliveries during the pandemic. Um, and I think that will probably grow as more people stick with doing deliveries. Um, so I think it's a growing area here. I think it's really just been taking off lately and having a cargo bike shop obviously has helped a lot because you can just go over and try all these different kinds and they can hook you up with a loaner. And it just, once you start seeing them as a normal thing, um, that makes, that's a game changer. It's not like this one like person who has one. Yeah, uh, I also think FedEx is coming. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, FedEx yeah, is going to a lot of cities right now. I think yeah, we're getting. Yeah, I'm curious if we'll see that here. We, yeah, you know. I, oh, sorry. Oh, Dave, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna just throw in that um, I started a uh, uh, delivery service in Berkeley, California, mm -hmm. in the mid '90s. Originally, it was called PedEx, and uh, so you're just talking about that. Then FedEx actually. Uh, threatened to sue us because um, <laughs> they saw we had uh, our kind of our our logo was a as a cargo biker with uh, wings and they, they must have thought we were about to like, start flying around but we ended up changing our name to Pell Express but but one one thing I was just going to mention the reason why I asked about delivery services is because we ended up doing all kinds of municipal business you know for mm -hmm. in Oakland uh, Berkeley and Emeryville and like delivering all kinds of stuff you know via cargo bike particularly when berkeley uh was redoing their entire uh retrofitting their, their city hall and then mm -hmm. all the uh departments are spread out across the city and so we were you know delivering food doing all kinds of crazy stuff nice nice thanks dave okay um i want to get to this question from kevin o'brien it's actually two questions um so first, uh, did you notice any increase of reporting for uh, road bike lane conditions? I was thinking that maybe the infrastructure reporting mm -hmm. would be heard more, you know, with staff out there experiencing it, I think. And then um, were there any maintenance concerns on behalf of department mm -hmm. heads in terms of just maintenance on the bikes in particular, since it's not equipment they're familiar with? Yeah, so as to the having more reports I mean, I have to say we have a super robust reporting system for problems here. So 
I, I and some of the staff wouldn't have needed to report it because the people riding the bike were the ones who would have fixed it. So, um, you know, and so I we didn't really ask them if they saw things like that, like that they would have just fixed on their own. Um, but you know, I didn't. But I can see if your city didn't already like we have a very uh, active community in reporting issues, so they get to us pretty fast. But um, I do think that if you know staff see things themselves because they're traveling and you know they're taking different routes and whatever you can maybe just avoid citizen reporting which would be super nice because people would i mean i know like if i'm riding places i see things and then you know i just tell the staff like hey i saw whatever and it needs fixed and it doesn't have you know just makes it quicker to to see it so i'm hoping that that would be a long-term benefit is that staff ourselves would see as we would be on the bike taking different routes that people normally would have to report it themselves. And then with the main, I mean, we gave it to our fleet office first so they could see it and tinker and like see what it was and feel confident that they could fix it. And then, I mean, I have to admit, we did have a problem and we just made Patricia fix it. <laughs> By problem, they it broke the it lock. Not, yeah. It was because they like had it locked and they tried to push it forward while it was locked. Uh, yeah. So they broke a. Um, actually, wait. I think I. I was just playing yeah. with the little thing that they broke. It's on my desk. Um, yeah, they're like little breakable pieces. Our fleet office felt pretty good about it. Like they had it first, and we let them keep it a little while, and they felt pretty comp. I mean, we have such a wide array of vehicles that this is probably way simpler than some of the other things that they have to maintain. I have to imagine. Yeah. I mean, the biggest things that you're going to have with these bikes are bleeding brakes, which is going to be the biggest municipal, you know, when you start getting into the motor, you know, you're going to probably need to either take that to a bike shop or to us kind of thing, um, chains, tensions, that sort of stuff. But the rest of it's all, honestly, pretty much your maintenance guy in your shop is probably going to be able to figure it out pretty easily. Yeah. I'd yeah, say the yeah. real bleach is probably the one that they'd be like, what? <laughs> Yeah, and we have some other city bikes, plus we use our bike share system, but our other city bikes, like, a lot of times we just make it easier, like, we just take them to a local bike shop if they need something, just to keep it simple for everyone. Yeah, I imagine a lot of um, Vermont departments might just take advantage of the local bike shops. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of nice, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even if it's, because it's like, we, you know, you want to have that bike shop relationship develop with the city and, yeah. and kind of the hope going forward so um yeah yeah great so right, i have we'll, to i have to run yeah um, we're a little bit over time thank you both so much this has been great and um yeah. folks the the follow-up will include the recording to this feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions and um thanks for coming thanks so much to yeah. Patricia and renee again and i hope to be in vermont one of these days we hope to have you here yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right thanks everyone <laughs> thanks yeah. guys Thanks. Bye.